All right, let's give a big afternoon welcome to Jennifer Simpson to kick off the afternoon programming. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Please continue to enjoy your lunch and drinks. I'm Jennifer Simpson, and my action pledge is to continue to lead the Finance Leaders Fellowship, but with a pledge to focus on facilitating collective action in the finance industry, which is above and beyond our current AGLN fellowship model. Today, one thing that we know is constant is that the world is always changing. Demographers say by 2050, 88% of the next billion people entering the middle class will be from emerging economies like China, India, Indonesia, and others. We know that change can open up opportunity, and this kind of shift creates a chance for companies and NGOs to expand products and services, but it also creates some dilemmas and issues that we're going to talk about today. We'd like to thank MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth for sponsoring this, and especially our friend Shamina Singh, Yay! who's going to be on the stage. <laughs> Established as an independent subsidiary of MasterCard, the center activates the company's core assets to catalyze action on inclusive growth through research, data, philanthropy programs, and engagement. So first, I'd like to welcome to the stage Shane Tajarati. Shane is president of Honeywell's global high growth region, but before you sit down, Shane, um, he's responsible for the company's business expansion in Asia, Africa, Latin America, Middle East, and Eastern Europe. Honeywell invents and manufactures technologies related to energy, safety, security, productivity, and global urbanization. Shane is based in Shanghai, China, although I bet he's not there that often. And we're thrilled that he's awake and here today with us. So thank you, Shane. <laughs> thank Come you. on over and tell us your action pledge. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Jen. It's really nice to be here. I'm a Henry Crown Fellow. Uh, class of uh, 2006, Great Expectations, and uh, very privileged to be also working with Shadia for the Middle East Leadership Initiative and with Peter Reiling uh, for the China Fellowship Programs, uh, two great programs. I'd like to, you to recognize them here, <clears throat> everything that they've done. The last, uh, the last two major regions in the world to really become part of the family of, uh, of Aspen. My uh, action pledge is uh, to continue to work in building what, I, what eventually would become a credit union for what I call fifth class citizens of the world. Not, not second or third class citizens, people that are, uh, that are not legal, they're not registered, they're not recognized whether for religious or racial or gender reasons. Uh, we're in the fourth year running, we're focusing on a couple of countries and uh, hopefully we'll become a real bank for the for the unbankable. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Nora Sweet. Come on up. Nora is the founder of Global Ventures, a Dubai-based growth stage venture capital firm. Nora has been investing in the MENA region. <laughs> it's like this show. No, come on over. Um, in the MENA entrepreneurial ecosystem since 2008, pre uh, previously serving as the CIO of the Dubai Future Foundation and as managing partner of Leap Ventures. She's also part of our inaugural class of the Finance Leaders Fellows. Come on over. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. So first, super honored to be here and part of the inaugural class of the Finance Fellows, which couldn't have happened without Ranji, Chris, Jen, and so many other people here. So just a big, big thank you for making the Finance Fellowship happen. Um, so my action pledge, which is also my venture since I'm still a fellow, um, is to change the shape of private capital in the Middle East ecosystem. And the reason that I want to do that is we have about 50% of the population in the region under age 30, and we have 40% youth unemployment. Currently, venture capital in the region has about $240 million across Middle East and North Africa in active venture funds. So that's very, very little funding for such a growing rapid population. So we've launched the Middle East Venture Capital Association with the thinking that by collaborating and raising the profile of venture capital and the opportunity, we'll be able to change the dynamics of private equity and venture capital in our part of the world. Thank you. I don't think Shamina needs any introduction, but 
Yeah, so come on up. Shamina Singh is Exe Executive Vice President of Sustainability at MasterCard, and you can go ahead and take a seat. Uh, and the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Shamina is active throughout the Aspen Institute, and again, we appreciate your hand in helping sponsor this. Um, I'd like to welcome Parag Mehta up to the stage, who's also with MasterCard, to talk about the Center's Action Pledge. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm excited to be here, and I'm the new executive director of the center, and on behalf of our president, Shamina, and the rest of the center team, um, our action pledge is that we will connect one million micro-entrepreneurs around the world to social and digital networks that will enable them to grow their businesses and to catalyze prosperity in their communities, because we believe that this is how you end poverty. Okay, so let's get started. We're gonna have a few minutes to talk up on stage, but while we're doing this, be thinking of your questions because we're gonna open it up to you all in the audience, including the youth in the back in about 15 minutes. So be thinking. Um, thanks for being here. Shane, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, you know, we, we talked about at Honeywell, you're in charge of, sounds like the, the whole earth of expansion, <laughs> but maybe you could tell us a little bit about Honeywell and where your growth is coming from and also the sort of macro trends that you're seeing as it relates to right. the subject. If you don't mind, I, I'll just like to step back a little bit. Um, uh, the way I look at uh, what's going on, I guess many of uh, our fellows think about these things, but I think about maybe from around 1600s, mid 1600s to about 1980. Um, those 300 years, essentially the world uh, changed quite a bit. Uh, in, a, in about 1600, 40% of the economies of the world was China and India. And America didn't really exist as, as such. And the rest of it was hodgepodge of Europe and all the, uh, the colonies. From then on, through the Industrial Revolution until 1980, we basically made about 700 million people fairly wealthy. Um, you know, we could analyze and, and talk about at the cost of many other places like Africa, or like the, the, the various colonies around the world, and the rest of the world fairly unwealthy. And we had, we created terminologies such as, you know, first world, third world, we skipped the second world because there was nothing in the middle. We, we have, um, you know, we have, you know, developing, we, we made nice words for them like developing nations and so on and so forth, and then later on came out with bricks. But reality was at the cost of, one-tenth of humanity was very wealthy, and the nine-tenth uh, was, was struggling. Uh, that really is not a very good scorecard for humanity. If you think about it, I'd, I, I uh, tend to give it an F or maybe a D minus, uh, because it really isn't something that humanity as a whole can be proud of. Well, then came China, uh, and they decided to go on a very different development model. They refused to, to accept, uh, you know, they had two, three hundred years of humiliation and time to think and how to, how to do it, but they did it very differently. And the world said, no, you're going to fall, and the Berlin Wall fell, uh, Tiananmen Square happened. But then, starting in the 1990s, China really began to develop in a way that was unprecedented, not in the same Western model. So I don't think there was ever a BRICS. I think there was what I call a crest, the big C and the rest. I think what happened in China, if you, if you take the past 15 years, we did in the past 15 years what humanity did in 300 years. We raised another billion people out of poverty, 72% of that from China. Uh, including, you know, if you take anything, child, child mortality, literacy, women's uh, rights, and uh, health, and so on and so forth. And on the back of that, it has emboldened India. It has emboldened parts of Africa. It has emboldened the next billion. So I think that the story of the past 30 years has been this new billion that has come from the bottom of the pyramid, and, but not in the same way at, as we have had in the past 300 years. And I think that rate is now accelerating. And I think if you take um, what I'm responsible for is outside of US, North America, and say Western Europe, uh, that's about 35, 40% of the economy of the world, but derives 65% of the growth of the world. Where is that growth being driven? Is by rise of the bottom of the pyramid to the next, what we call the next emerging middle class. And I think Shamina will talk about that, the next emerging middle class. We think of middle class when we're about 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars GDP per capita. This, that's not the, the concept. This middle class is roughly around less than 10,000 GDP per capita. They still have 
ambitions and, and, and capabilities to invest and, and spend like the middle class there. Reality is the products and services they need have to meet the same quality, but are about one-fifth to one-tenth the cost. So for companies like us, the challenge had been we knew that we couldn't invest or invent this new set of products and services with a Western mindset. Because we had a, first of all, a colonial mindset. Secondly, a mindset that you know, we can invest something, invent something in the West. We bring a key and tell you, do you have a door that could fit that key? And we, 15 years ago, we said, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to go and create solutions and innovations in the East for East. We call it East for East. And that transformation helped the company tremendously change its internal culture. Where we're not thinking of uh, everything, all goodness comes from the West, and then the rest will, will, will uh, benefit from it. We're now beginning to build a company. As a result, last year we drove 82% of our growth from high growth regions, with only 25% of our, our total revenue. And it's in the forefront of our, we're, we're the best performing multi industry company, really, all of it coming from what people term bottom of the pyramid or the lower end of the market. So that's what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about the next billion that's going to come from parts of Africa, from parts of India, from parts of Indonesia, from other parts of China and Latin America, et cetera. Thank you. Noor, in, in the Middle East region, you, you gave us some statistics already about employment and the ways that you're trying to address from the VC community. But can you tell us a little bit more about maybe an example of a, a company or something that's going on in the region and, and how that compares when new companies are expanding there or you know, sort of how the government is um, set up compared to what, what those of us in the West might know? Sure. So um, the region is about 400 million people, so it's an economy about you know, a population about the size of the US. Um, and the GDP per capita varies across the region. So it can go up to about 30,000 all the way down to areas in North Africa, which are much lower. Um, the interesting part is that it's an educated population. So we have 120,000 engineers graduating every year from our colleges. And because of the nature of the demographics and this demographic bulge, everyone's very interested in tech and in working in tech. And there are very few jobs to start with. And so if you're going to create a job for yourself, it's probably going to be in tech. What's happened is that there's very little capital in the ecosystem, which is quite odd for most people to think about because <clears throat> the region exports a lot of capital. So we have sovereign wealth funds. Their job is to invest outside the region. We have um, no, so no endowments, no pension funds. And the family offices that are very renowned um, will invest in the region in their operating assets, but otherwise invest outside to diversify away. So this has created a gap in the market. A lot of people start companies. We have multitudes of accelerators and incubators and a lot of angel investors. So there's a lot of hype and activity. So we have lots of companies starting. As they start to scale, however, there is very little venture funding. There is very little private equity funding in the ecosystem. Um, and I look back at a time when, in 2005, I moved back to the region and joined a company that my dad had started. And um, the first thing we did was do a private placement. We brought in $120 million from industry. And within three years, we scaled the company. It went from 60 mil rev in dollars to 600 mil rev. We went from being just a GCC company to the largest global company in the world in interior contracting. And then by 2008, in April, um, we had an IPO. So I ran the IPO on the London Stock Exchange as a main listing at a $1.1 billion valuation. Most of the investors were from New York and London. But that value creation, that employment, we went from employing 1,000 people to 9,500 in three years. And that ability to do that would have never happened without that injection of capital. And so when you look at the region and you look at success stories, we've had Souk, which recently sold to Amazon, which to a lot of people is, you know, it's the first time Amazon buys into a region rather than buying technology. Um, and it illustrates the difficulty of growing in the region, because otherwise they would have grown them by themselves. So to us, that also illustrates the fact that our entrepreneurs are just as smart, they work twice as hard, and they manage to scale when capital is available, like it was in the case of Souk. But a large part of that was capital from outside the region. We're now seeing you know, Alibaba looking at the region. We've had NEA invest in the region. We've had Sequoia invest in the region in different companies. Fet Fetcher is a company that NEA invested in. And that company speaks to the true innovation side, where if you're sitting in emerging markets, you will find emerging market problems that you can solve. No one's sitting in Silicon Valley thinking about how to solve the problem they did. 
which was most emerging markets don't have addresses. So if you want to deliver something, you want the whole you know, boom of e-commerce, that's great, but how do we deliver if most people don't have street names and addresses? So they said, well, most people might not have an address, but everyone has a cell phone. So why don't we deliver to the person's phone instead of delivering to the person's house? Um, and so again, and that applies not just in Middle East, North Africa, but all of Africa, most of India, Pakistan, Iran, I could keep going. Most of emerging markets have this street address problem. Um, so NEA came in and funded the growth of that company. It's now worth a couple hundred million dollars, um, but we had to rely on external capital. And so that's you know, one example of innovation that's happening in our part of the world um, that really applies globally to the new global economy. Thank you. So, so Noor, you and Shane have both talked about um, recognizing that for um, the opportunity in a particular region that you know can be different and you need to tailor and, and maybe even leapfrog, but um, meet, meet the customers and the opportunity where they are. Yeah. Shamina, from, from the center's standpoint, um, what are you seeing in relation to this shift and, and as it relates specifically to inclusion, how are you addressing that? Well, the reason that I wanted to, uh, the reason I lobbied Tommy to let us have this forum is because I think the information that we're hearing, at least for me, is almost revolutionary. Um, we're experiencing in real time a new world order restructuring. And so I thought it would be really important for my fellow Aspen fellows to hear about this and to understand it so that um, contextually we can figure out sort of what our roles are um, in the context of this global transformation. Yesterday, we heard about the future of work um, from you know, Sheila, and, and other, who we have a partnership with, thank you, care.com. Mm -hmm. um, and she talked about the, the changing nature of work and, and the other. But what Shane has just talked about and what Noor is just talking about is a wholesale shift of how certainly multinational companies, but consumers, governments, investors are thinking about where to place bets and what the world's gonna look like. And along with that comes things like, what does climate change look like when you have a brand new middle class living in Indonesia, India, China, Vietnam, Cambodia, in some markets where there aren't things that we have here, like in the United States, like the Foreign Corrupt, Corrupt Practices Act, where if we're a multinational working in any, com in any other country, we have to adhere to specific rules and regulations. Um, it's transforming the way we have to do business, but it's also, it's also for the Center um, and for Inclusive Growth, transforming the way we have to think about um, social impact. It's taking on a whole new meaning because we're not doing, we are doing social impact, of course, to work at the bottom of the pyramid, but the social impact we're actually talking about is unleashing opportunity for the missing middle class and the new segment of a middle class that we haven't seen before, but growing it or at least trying to inform the growth in such a way that involves inclusion rather than inequality. So Shane described, what did you say, the first 600 years was making 700 million people rich? 300 years, yeah. So this is an opportunity, I think, that we as a global network of fellows, certainly people who touch government, who touch business, um, who have enormous influence uh, to create or at least inform a new world order that could grow inclusively, meaning that the benefits of all of these growing economies accrue to everyone instead of to the top percentile. Thank you. And, and Shane, as it relates to what Shamina was just describing, how at Honeywell are you thinking about these growth opportunities and in particular when um, you know, sort of governments and maybe regulations or the rules of the road are different from place to place. Yeah. And, and then specifically as it relates to us as fellows, where do you think our role is, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, shooting the elephant or you know, remembering the sadhu or all of the things that we talk about? How, what is our role as fellows in these expansion opportunities? Yeah, I think um, a few things, a few thoughts come to, my, uh, to mind. One is that, first of all, even though this new development model is coming, you know, the first 300 years, it was really, uh, it was really the white man's world uh, at the cost of the rest. It doesn't really need to be like that. I think the, the whole idea that, you know, it's not a zero-sum game. Your, your gain is not my loss. And that China has proven that. And I think India and the rest of the countries. The second thing is the models are very different from country to country, from region to region. Um, there is no such thing. And we stopped calling these regions emerging regions eight years ago. 
when they were already contributing more than 50% of our, our growth? How could they be emerging? They're already emerged. So we call them just high growth regions. For, uh, because inside the company, we also want people to think of them differently. We don't want uh, always like a 27-year-old manager in Minneapolis be in charge of the rest of the world and just tick and make them a spreadsheet. Like my graces are yeah. pouring over to you. So as, as a company, we've changed the structure of the company. So decision making is now happening at the, at the, um, at the closer to these uh, markets. It's probably the most difficult thing for a multinational company. So for 100 years, we developed all of our products. We're 116 years old. All of our products and services in America, and we send them to the rest of the world. What's wrong with that? The reality is when China started developing like this and the rest of the world, that, that model failed. That model failed because you could only address 10% of the market. Mm -hmm. And then in a country like China, when multinationals were doing that, you know what happened? Because they sent their supply chain there, thousands of competitors began to rise because they said, you cannot fulfill my, my needs. We have, in the rest of the world, maybe 30 competitors. In China, in the bottom of the pyramid, 11,000. In the middle of the pyramid, 1,500. In the upper end of the pyramid, we have, we have 120, and we have five that are already global. Nowhere in the world is that same phenomena there. So one of the challenges is, you really want to compete in this new world in the next 10 years, you got to become a Chinese competitor. You cannot fight them from outside. There's no way. You got to go in there and with chopsticks and with, with, uh, uh, with everything else. And then the same thing is now happening in the rest of China is unique. There's no other, in the rest of all high growth regions, we have 35 competitors. So, in the, yeah. so that dynamic is, Sorry, yeah, teaching gonna, multinational companies a different set of tools. I was just going to say, just to give this a little bit more um, context, uh, China and beyond, I wrote down the statistics because, again, I'm just obsessed with this whole, this whole shift. Yeah. Um, around 2020, the majority of the global population for the first, uh, of the global middle class population, for the first time ever, 90% uh, will be in Asia. Yeah. For the first time ever. It'll also be the tipping point of poverty eradication. If anybody's following the SDGs, you know that by 2030, the promise of the new social compact is to eradicate extreme poverty. That's, that's Asia that's doing that. Then it's gonna to come to Africa. Africa has, uh, Ralph will know this better than me, but the most arable, farm, farmable land in the world. So we're gonna to start to see things shift in a way that we haven't seen, but I just wanted to say, to give it context, the top 20 markets, Indonesia is going to hit it by 2020. Italy is going to drop. By 20, I gave my glasses to Ashley. By 2030, Mexico joins the top. France drops out. So these things are happening. And politics is, and everything else involved is all there. But these trends are coming. Yeah. Wait, can I add Egypt and Saudi Arabia also join the top 20? Right, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think one of the things that's, that's happening with this is that we have to get very comfortable that humanity as a whole now matters for the, for the destiny of mankind, not just the Western uh, order. And this is probably the struggle that we're all going through. And I, I guess when that happens, when you think about that, businesses seem a, a very small uh, part of that agenda, but it really isn't. I think business is a great um, facilitator of that if we can be enlightened to realize that and to create that, that kind of uh, leadership today. When I joined the company 14 years ago, I was the only non-American and the only uh, I'm Persian, I'm the only non-American on, the, on, the, on our leadership team and the only one that uh, didn't live in America. Today, more than uh, half of our leadership team is non-American. We have Indians, we have Chinese, we have, we have people from different backgrounds and decisions are being made where these problems are, are being created. So the, the, the great mega trend is, first of all, this population is urbanizing. It's incredible when, when rural population urbanize, what kind of problems they have to deal with. Majority of the world has little arable land, lots of people, problem that we don't know about in Colorado, right? So you got millions of people trying to live, and then as their, as their uh, standard of living goes up, they're, um, you know, they eat more meat, they, they, have, they want to live better lives, they want to use air conditioning, just you and I want to do, so their, their footprint begins to grow. 
And uh, so the challenges of safety, security, energy efficiency, um, uh, feeding the population, and then health care, and then climate change. All of these are, I think, companies that address these global megatrends. And we've, we've tried to change our portfolio to address these at a cost point, which is about one-tenth to one-fifth of what we're used to. Those are the companies we should be betting on in the future. But I was going to say, betting on them in such a way that I think values have to be part of the bet. Correct. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. that's what I think the, the goal, at least what I think the opportunity here is, mm -hmm. is that this is not happening without us. This is happening with us. And it's happening right now. And so I think this idea of growth. And one thing that I learned about being at MasterCard, and for everybody who knows me, I've been a fellow for 150 years. I was in the fourth class. But I'm almost as old as Keith. But um, the, <laughs> but the, but what I've learned is that um, if this is something that for business people, public sector people, we don't, the, our values are, this, this, this fellowship has created this uh, muscle inside of us, that it comes no matter what we're thinking about or what we're doing. And so what I've learned being at MasterCard is that this, com this company called MasterCard is in 210 markets. It is a global network. It doesn't know borders. So there are things that transcend government. There are thing things that transcend you know, population, strife, and, and, and most of the time, or at least what I've seen, where I think the opportunity might be are global institutions, of course, like the UN and, and everything else. But it's also, it could be enlightened leaders leading big companies. Absolutely. And Absolutely. what if some of those enlightened leaders were Aspen Fellows? In fact, we already are. So we've thrown a lot of raw material, to put it in Honeywell's terms, out, out, in the, <laughs> out into the room. And I'd just like to open it up if anybody has questions at the moment. We've teased you with a lot of thoughts around macro trends and the way that we could act as, as, a, as fellows and um, what is, what's happening in the Middle East. Does anybody have questions you'd like to ask of the panelists? We've got one here. Do we have microphones <coughs> here at table 35? That's 35. Bonnie, our China fellow. Right there. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the sharing and uh, hearing all about China and uh, being from China. Uh, I have a question about um, cross-cultural curiosity. Um, as we move towards a more globalized world, um, from China I know, <laughs> Lots of Chinese in the mega cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Hong Kong. Uh, we have a huge appetite to learn about the Western culture, to um, meet people, and uh, to learn all the all the things that we're not familiar about. Um, I want to ask um, Shane, especially, uh, do you see the same curiosity from the West about? the Chinese culture or the, or the Asian or the Eastern culture in general? And how do we foster and cultivate more of that so that, the, so that we see humanity as a whole? Thank you. Well, I hate to generalize things because I, I, I will be off by a large, uh, large amount, I think. But by and large, in my, uh, I've lived in China for about 25 years and I've been traveling around the world for almost the same amount of time, and I do a bit of, uh, quite a bit of visits in the West, uh, talking about China, obviously, in, in Washington and other places, and in Europe. And I'd have to say that there's a lot more um, knowledge from, say, the average Chinese or average Indian has about our political system, our lives, our, our, our if you like, our, even our Hollywood and all that, and everything, than the other way around. In fact, uh, what I found in the past six or seven years because of the rise, increasing rise of China economically, there's almost like a, this, this scare that, oh my goodness, this, uh, you know, we are being challenged in the world. Uh, you know, there's a scare about the Chinese. Do they hold the same value as us? Um, and uh, you know, just in the spirit of being very candid, uh, some of them thinking, are they even part of us? I mean, can I even feel and pinch them? If I pinch them, will they? Will they feel the hurt, because they look so different than us. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in this and that. And all of that is really a set of prejudices that we've built over years. And because of the rise of China, I think some of that has been exasperated. I think there's also, we, we, there is generally, now because of 
social media and, and, and the internet, that trend in China has gone down. Generally, people read more. In, in, in they used to, at least, for a long time. So if you ask the average Chinese to describe the, pol the political system in America, they'll get a much better, you'll get a much better read, and they'll be very accurate than probably the average American. So, but to, I mean, Bonnie has a great question, and she uh, probably agrees with your assessment. So I don't know if, Shamina, yeah. from a MasterCard standpoint, if you proactively <clears throat> do something to try to understand. Well, it's interesting. So when you did your introduction of me, basically you described what I have a remit to do. So the Center for Inclusive Growth, um, the tools at our disposal are all of MasterCard's data and technology and people and money, philanthropic money, not all the money, I wish. But, the, but the, the point I say that, why that's important, is because in the world there are two billion people who carry MasterCard. There are over two trillion transactions that happen on the MasterCard network. It's a lot of information that's, that's, that we know, not about individual people, but about things that are trends that are happening around the world. Tourism, we can track tourism. And the tourism that we can see, it's fascinating. M to your point, much, many more tourism dollars coming out of China into other markets, coming out of India into other markets. Much less tourism traffic dollars going from US, Europe into China and India. Yes. And so from <clears throat> the pure you know, economic standpoint, if I'm the United States, I'm really happy. And, I can, you can, and we all see this, and in, like New York City and everywhere else, conscious uh, you know, consumerism, catering to a Chinese and Indian and, you know, Asian population. Um, so it's a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting construct because the other thing that we know to be true is that unless knowledge, knowledge can move around the world in a, in a second, that's the internet, that's all the technology, but know-how, the way, the way you do something, the way you learn something, the know-how is only transmitted through people. And so... This, this idea of tourism and the transmission of know-how, I think, are two, two big pieces. Any other questions? We have one here just behind table 10. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I'm Javier Brew, Cali 13. Uh, this might be a holistic question, maybe, but um, during your speech, you talk about being inclusive on this growth. And I would like to know, what are your thoughts on how to make this new growth inclusive and not the big international companies eating this new market? Um, I think it has to be domestic. I mean, so our, what, I'll just tell you what we're doing, and then you can decide whether it or not it's inclusive. But the frame is around the, the definition of inclusive growth as we understand it is one where growing economies share the benefits of the growing economy with all citizens in the economy. So the way that we've attacked it, and may or may not be the, it's not the only way, but it's the way that we know how to do it is through financial inclusion. So our belief is that unless you're operating in a formal economy with the regulation, with the protection, with the digital access, with the technology that comes with things like a formalized bank account, a regulated loan, secured credit, you're going to be subject to the whims, the fluctuations, the shocks that come in a black market economy and in the informal economy. It also, you're also trapped because you can only grow your business, your livelihood, uh, and everything else in a way that is proximate to where you are. You can only leapfrog once you get into the formal economy. That's when your growth comes, and we've seen it. So other companies can do other things. Other centers can do other things. What we're focused on is um, financial inclusion uh, for people around the world. And we named ourselves the Center for Inclusive Growth because we also understand that financial inclusion is only the step. It's not the end. It's the input. The output is inclusive growth. And that's moving from poverty alleviation to shared prosperity. Yeah. Over here. We're going to bunch I'm making <laughs> And then maybe okay. raise your hands again if you had another. OK, so the next one will be right here in the middle if you could move over. At table 36. Hi. My question is, we often talk about Africa in the same context as China, India, Indonesia. And obviously, those are countries, and Africa is a continent. So how do you think about approaching that market? Because we all know that Africa is a continent of 50-plus countries, different languages, different <coughs> political structures. 
So how do you all think about approaching the continent of Africa? And then related to that is, how do you think about, as a global company, allocating resources when you have these, um, these high growth markets? How do you think about where you go first? Pr presumably you have limited resources and, and you can't you know, go into all of them at the same pace. So how do you make those kinds of decisions? Yeah. Um, I think it's a very good question. Uh, for, from our perspective, if you take just, uh, you take BRICS, uh, 2000, when Jim O'Neill said, uh, you know, created that term, to 2015, uh, China was about, uh, going forward, China created 9, 000, $9 trillion uh, dollars worth of uh, economic output. U.S. was about 8.8 .8, uh, during that period. That's about 74, 75% of all BRICS. Africa was less than 2% of it, South Africa, which was the, the S in. So really, it was not really BRICS in that way. Even India, Brazil, and Russia, they were only about 1.1, 1.2 trillion. So they were very little in, the, in that context. Uh, but I think things, much has changed since 2000, or even from 2015. I think Africa, obviously, for, for us, uh, there's a couple of things we do. We, we have what we call first tier economies where we have to have full formula in which everything needs to be done as if it was our home economy. And those are very few in the world. It's China, it's India, it's um, parts of Middle East where we're, we're still, you know, Middle East as a cluster is a little bit of a misnomer, but anyways, we've, we've made Middle East. And Brazil, uh, sorry, um, uh, Mexico, and then uh, Brazil. Brazil has, is now an outlier because of the way it's been mismanaged, and a lot of companies have kind of put Brazil in the penalty box for a little while, but, uh, but we'll get there. Africa and, say, Central Asia, say, Russia and Eastern Europe, these are all in the next tier where you will do a lot of localization, you'll do a lot of local uh, training and all that, but they're not yet full, uh, full formula. A full formula is where you do everything innovation, decision making, you, it becomes your second home. There are very few of those. Africa, uh, for us, we kind of look at, looked at Africa and we realized even just saying sub-Saharan Africa, Northern Africa is just too, is too uh, uh, you know, easy. Uh, it's at least five distinct regions when you exclude Egypt and Libya. We put e Egypt and Libya part of like the greater Middle East because the economies were much more akin to that. So we have like the Maghreb countries, the, the, the Northern Africa, uh, French-speaking countries, the certain dynamics going between Algeria, uh, Morocco, and so on and so forth. Then West Africa, which is really Nigeria, which itself, I, I know Dela is here, is gonna laugh at me when I say we have a very distinct uh, thing for Nigeria and the satellite economies. Then you have the East African bloc, which is, the econo uh, which is 200 plus plus million, if you include uh, other countries that are not in the bloc, like, like Ethiopia, which are really rising. And then you have the southern cone. And then you have a huge number, about 30, 35 countries that are dark today, mm -hmm. that are not growing, that are becoming more destitute, that are ridden with war in the you know, Central African Republic and you know, Congo and so on and so forth. There are companies that are doing things, but by and large, when we are not there, I find, because we're about what, urbanization, safety, security, aerospace, you know, the city. When we're not there, I just know those economies aren't, aren't growing the way they should. Um, so very tough. I think Africa is gonna be lopsided. I think technology is playing a huge role in stepping Africa up. You know, technology played a huge role in finance in Africa. Uh, in some countries like Uganda, you've got two mobile phones per person uh, on average. Um, but I do think there's still a lot to be said about all the basics that, that Shamina talked about, the rule of law, the official economy. Most of Africa still runs on black economy. So those are challenges of Africa. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Moshmi Khan. I'm a Henry Crown Fellow, class of 2007. Uh, my question is regarding the role of governments and the role of civil society in this development that you speak of. I, and the context is, I'm coming from Bangladesh. For the last eight years, I've been living and working in Bangladesh, which is a country of 160 million people in the size of Wisconsin. And it's about to enter middle-income country, at least it's projected to go into middle-income country. And as I know Shamina knows very well, it's the uh, world's second largest producer of ready-made garments. 
confidence. And the reason I bring that up is because it seems like a lot of uh, growth is happening in spite of governments, and but at the same time, you need the uh, development agencies and support of civil society. So I'd really like to hear you guys kind of address the role of governments and regulatory issues as well as civil society development partners in this kind of inclusive growth. Noor, sure. you want to take that um, one? So I, I think that the observation that the growth is happening in spite of government is, is something that I can echo country after country after country. Um, and I think that in some cases, that's actually not such a bad thing, is my personal opinion. Um, and one great case is like the leapfrogging in finance in Africa and in other markets. Because if you start to think about where fintech is actually taking off in emerging markets, it's where there's less regulatory frameworks. So if you had all this regulation and the central banks involved to the nth degree like you might in other markets, then it would be hard for the innovators to get any traction. Um, so whereas I do believe in government and, and the role of, kind of structure and legal frameworks, um, I don't think that government, and especially in emerging markets, the people working in government um, are potentially ready for the changes that are happening. And I think that in the youth bulge demographic countries, um, it's very difficult for them to regulate as it is, yet alone regulate something that hasn't been invented yet. Um, I think governments, and here I'm generalizing again to, to, um, to your point, which we shouldn't do, but um, I think to a large extent, governments in emerging markets and serving in government is a privilege and a job that most people try to keep as long as they can. Um, and often, you know, there's no end date. And so most of government officials in these markets that I've seen <laughs> tend to act with job preservation strategies rather than um, risky strategies of um, bringing innovation on board. And I say this all at the risk of MasterCard sitting by my side. <laughs> so. uh, no, I just, uh, no, <laughs> no, not at, I mean, I think that, look, I think Darren Walker was here yesterday, right? So civil society, I don't know if you mentioned this, but um, I just left a meeting with Darren Walker where he, the Ford Foundation, is building out a whole new segment called Publis Public Interest Technology. They're building what in the United States was called public interest law that came about in the 1950s and 60s. Public interest law, the idea you defend prisoners, you have access to a lawyer, you have the um, ACLU, those are all constructs that came out of the Ford Foundation that they funded. So. Uh, now Darren and team are thinking about what does it mean for technology? What does public interest tech look like? And what does that construct look like? So he actually brought together the presidents and provosts of the leading universities across the United States alongside mass market university leaders and a couple of, in, a couple, in the center and a couple of others to talk about this. That's the role of, that can be the role of civil society. When you have, a, uh, a, when you have an infrastructure that works, one of the things that um, I, we've been talking about inside conversations, and I'm not going to put Angie on the spot, but uh, Angie and Addie and myself sat over lunch and came up with a pledge um, in about 10 minutes because the Africa Leadership, uh, the Africa Leadership Impact um, Conference is the place where you can, they, we can produce that infrastructure of leadership that can absorb the capital that needs to come from other parts of the market until the capital is built up inside the market. So again, I don't know, Angie might not even be here, but we did do it. Hi, Angie. <laughs> we don't, you don't have to say the pledge if you don't want to, but do you want to say the pledge? <laughs> <laughs> There's a mic behind. Thank goodness I wrote it out. <laughs> we will work with the United Governing Bodies of Ali to enable the second Africa Impact Forum become a reality in 2019, seeking to catalyze the, achieve, to catalyze, um, the achievement of the SDGs by 2030 in Africa. Oh. So I know we had a question over in the corner, if we could get the mic all the way over there. In the meantime, are there any youth that have questions? Oh, you're a youth? Yeah? Okay. We'll go here and then we'll go over to, to um, table back here. Hi. Harry. Uh, my name is N.T. It's a Henry Crown Fellow of 2010. Um, my question is, I, I feel like a big part of the story, and this is generalizing, simplifying a bit, 
with China and India is that there's a superstructure, call it the, the government, that sits above a billion plus people. You know, and if you sort of take that and you say 1% will be remarkable and able to drive for it, that's 10 million people, which is a size, it's larger than most countries. How do you, what are the elements that you've seen where other places that don't have that kind of superstructure, smaller population of people can punch above their weight to get that multiplier effect and move into the next level and, approach, and uh, appeal to the honey wells of the world, et cetera. So those 35, you know, that are sort of dark right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, you talk about the superstructure. I think really in, in reality, the, the only real superstructure on a, on a large scale that exists is really China. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think yes. you can say it's China and India. It's, they're two so dramatically different. And people make the mistake of saying, well, because China is autocratic and it's, it's, it's a communist country and so on, so they can dictate all of this thing. It was a very simple thing that they had in their hands. It was really, if you think, if you go right down to the bottom of it, it was land use. China had access to land use, and they, they appropriated it for the economic growth. Uh, first, they created their, their economic zones, and then they used the land to really reform the cities and all that. If you look at Chinese cities, they almost look like they're blueprints. You know, they, they, you get the core city, and you get the various different technology zones and all that. The problem with India was they don't have access to land. Land is privately owned. You can't, you know, the, the Bangalore airport was built 13, 14 years ago, and the only highway that they're supposed, the government was supposed to build, they're still in patches. They can't do it because they can't move people. If you go to Bombay Airport, there's 4,000 people living in the slum right in the airport, and they're building the airport around the slum because they cannot appropriate the land. So China had this privilege. That privilege doesn't exist with the rest of the world. And it's really a struggle for the countries and the, uh, for the economies to, to really grow because of this uh, inability for the governments to actually orchestrate. But the governments could be helpful with regulations, with good regulations that, that create level playing field, that create better taxation policy, that create better entrepreneurial policy, better financial transparency policy. And if you go around, I would say it goes from very structured in China to completely chaotic in cer certain parts of Central America, uh, to devastating in Brazil for a country which is probably richest in natural resources and terribly bad run. So governments matter. No, they uh, matter. And I'll say one more thing. Yeah. The thing that I worry about is that this, this growth that, we, uh, that we're talking about, countries that are richer than sort of where the United States was around the same time have not, they've not created the social safety exactly. nets that LBJ did. Um, in the 1960s when we were growing, the middle class. So where we have Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, you know, the Higher Education Act, all of these things that are required when you're building a society, Indonesia, not they happening. They don't have it. Don't have it. Yeah. So that's what worries me, are the things that have made success for the West. Yes. So uh, a great, you know, great place for many of us to thrive. Those same structures are not taking place um, in, in the places that are growing. And that, that worries me. There's, I, there's another thing that's happening. Sorry. You, no, you I was going to echo something you said yeah, earlier please go ahead. about the governments and land use. So to a much smaller degree, I mean, many of you have been to Dubai and yeah. many haven't. But Dubai is a great case, again, one person decision maker. And it was the land use. So we moved to Dubai in 95. There were less than a half a million people. I mean, even now, it's a country of five million plus minus, of which 10% is the indigenous population. Everybody else is an expat. But it was literally, how do we appropriate this round? Let's create free zones, the regulatory framework, financial infrastructure. Exactly. Um, and it's, I mean, Dubai sits now where within six hours flight, so from East Coast to West Coast, from Dubai, you can reach three billion people. So it's Africa, it's India, and it has kind of first world infrastructure. So our electricity doesn't cut. Right? Water works, everything's there, um, education system, healthcare. Um, and so it was this opportunity where 20 years ago they said, let's appropriate this land, let's build this regulatory framework, um, and let's become a hub. So people could argue, you know, the, you know, well, how large is the economy? You know, Honeywell's been there for a really long time, Microsoft's been there for a really long time, and these companies have started managing larger parts of our neighboring economies from Dubai because of the regulatory framework. So not just Dubai, or just the Gulf, or just MENA, or just Middle East and Africa, and now South Asia. So that's attractive talent, that's created an economy out of nothing. So you look back, when I moved there in 95, 
You know, there literally was nothing. It was six streets, perhaps, my school home, and I couldn't wait to go to college, right? And that was kind of the attitude. And, and then fast forward, and, um, and it's really the way that they appropriated the land and the regulatory framework. Thank you, Nora. I'm going to get to this question over here. Good afternoon. Dan Varner, uh, Pahara Fellow from the ninth class, the joyful 23 Forever Nine. Um, apologies in advance for asking a Western-centric question, but uh, it just occurs for me that there are both kind of uh, opportunities and challenges um, for folks in the West, in particular the United States, who've been left behind. So as I think about communities of color, Native American communities, and so on and so forth, what are the, so just speak for five minutes, what are the implications of this transition that you're describing for those communities in particular uh, here? So I would, I would say it's, it's not that, uh, it's not, as to your earlier point, it's not, I don't think it's a zero-sum game. So this is not you go down, we go up. This is the rate of change that's happening in the East. They're starting from a much lower starting point. So what we're talking about is the rate of growth. In the West, in the, West, in the United States, the, rate, the, the growth has been stagnant. And so the, it's two different kinds of growth that we're talking about. So when you're thinking about the United States and this idea of stagnant growth and the folks who've been left behind, the solutions have to be completely different. And the interventions have to be completely different. Now, again, I'll speak to it the, way, the same way I did to the, the first question. I don't know that we have the right answer. But one of the reasons why we partnered with Sheila Marcello was to understand that one in three Americans are stitching together income with more than one job. And it's called, they call it the gig economy. Independent workers, call it what you will. But the entire frame of work in the United States, it has changed. So this idea that you might be driving an Uber, an Uber from one to five, you're doing Etsy from, you know, at nighttime, and you're doing care.com from, you know, three, you know, three to four or whatever, that's the life of, of an American. So we have to think about the interventions in a completely different way, which is why I'm so interested in what Darren's thinking about with public interest tech and creating an entirely new infrastructure of how you deal with technology in a society where there is such inequality. Um, the other thing I'll say is that um, for the thing that keeps me up at night when I think about the United States is student loan debt. Debt overall in the United States is it's unsustainable. We are, in the United States, consumer debt has reached, um, is higher than it was before the Great Recession. Much of this is carried by students. So, and, and, and disproportionately, African American and Hispanic students graduate with more debt, make less money in employment, and have to pay it off over their entire lives. So start, talk about starting from a place, start, talk about starting from a, a place much different from even other Americans, it's an enormous situation. So for me, I think about debt. I, can, I, I think a lot about student loan debt. And then I think a lot about the disparity between African American and Hispanics um, and the disproportionate amount and length of time they carry debt. Well, I think that's a good segue. I just want to make sure if there are any questions in our student group that we address them. Any questions? Okay, I, I think we'll wrap up then. In our, um, in our dialogues over the week, we've been talking about courage and fearless leadership. And in particular, today we had a reading um, from a Malala. And in our group, we talked about not only our own journeys and working within a system or outside of a system, but we also talked about how could we make sure that we're clearing the way for our youth to take a stand, um, appropriately protecting them, but also allowing them that uh, leeway to, to take charge. Since we're talking about a statistic in 2050, um, I think that it's only right to make sure that we include the youth in this conversation. So I'm stalling a little bit, Duke, but do we have a question <laughs> back there from anybody? Okay, I see one. Ooh, there's, there's there two. Are a couple, there's two. You stimulated them well. Two, I see two back there. Yes, yes. Let's get both of them in. Okay, <laughs> um, since tell us right, your name. Okay. Oh, I'm Quinn. <laughs> okay. Um, so right now we live in a very like Western European centric culture. Maybe that's because the U.S. is such a big economic powerhouse. But do you think as countries like India and China are developing, do you think we'll see a shift to a more 
Eastern-centric um, culture and society? Well, I think uh, on the surface, uh, on the one hand, yes, obviously, because as we're getting more and more of the, uh, of the East, the wisdom of the East and the, the people from China and India becoming part of the family of the, uh, the nations. But I hope that instead of just now uh, saying, well, we've been a more Western-centric world for the past 300 years, uh, is it going to shift to the other side? I think technology and the fact that in the past 100 years, we've had this explosion of understanding that humanity is one. Uh, and that the oneness of mankind and the, 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 the fact that all of our fortunes are so intertwined with one another that we don't actually polarize to the other side and say, now it's the time of, the, it's the century of China. Now it's the century of India. I think those are nonsense. I think it's, it's the century of humanity. And it's so much more colorful if China, India, Middle East, Africa, all of that had opportunities to come. Obviously, they won't all come together at the same time because these developments are happening differently. But I do hope, and I see the, the signs, that we will have an opportunity to have most of humanity involved in the fortunes of mankind, not just the white or the yellow and the black. You know, all but do a semester in Beijing and tell me how it goes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> That'll do more than Nora, did you want to add something? Sure. I think it's the same when you think about restaurants. So 20, 30 years ago, if you wanted to eat Chinese food, you went to that part of town. If you wanted to eat sushi, it was really hard to find and a treat. Now you walk down any high, every high street and you have the influence of that food. And food is the first part of culture. Yeah. And I think as this generation, your generation grows, you know, having sushi from age six and Chinese food from age three, even as, you know, an Amer American whose mother and father probably come from two different parts of the U.S. or two different parts of the world, you know, I think that culture becomes something that is your personal understanding of many different parts of the world put together and is much more readily accessible. If I may just emphasize what both of you said, for the youth, uh, really, if you have the opportunity, take some time, take a year, and go to one of these countries, go to India, go to China, go to Africa. Our kids were, were born and raised in, in China. They were third culture kids, Persian kids born and raised in China. And they're so much more richer in their lives now in America because of that perspective. And, and I think if you can do it, do it, and go to as, as far away as you possibly can, embrace it, for a year. No. One Parents two, are frothing out. Yeah. They're like, shut up, Shane. <laughs> one or two weeks doesn't do it. And I tell you, China is one of the safest countries in the world to do that in. Uh, and, you know, for the parents, you should really have the courage to do that. With your kids. Okay. We're going to take one last question. There was one other question from the youth. Yes. Oh, hi, I'm Ava. I'm 15. And my question was, so before you guys were discussing countries that are growing but don't have the same infrastructure that, as we do in the US. Do you think that growth will be able to be sustained without, w without that infrastructure? Or do you think, yeah? So I think that the next level of growth requires a different kind of infrastructure. I think that leapfrogging has happened more than people realize. You know, so most of Africa, or large parts of Africa, didn't have you know, phones the way that we remember them, and landlines, but everybody has a cell phone or two. Um, and I think that there's small nuances in the way that the world has grown. You know, others in, in construction, um, you know, we say that IoT, so what you guys know is IoT, Internet of Things, is the new MEP. MEP refers to mechanical and electrical and plumbing, and now there's this whole massive thing around, like, how do we get over, we don't want to have, you know, sewer systems, or we don't want to have all, this, all these electric grids. And so what is, how can we leapfrog over that? So I think that as governments get involved or don't, um, the level of infrastructure required to build out countries differently um, over the next 20 years looks very different to the last 50 or 100 years. Yes. I think one of the things we've got to realize, some infrastructure is absolutely necessary for life, but thinking that infrastructure means American lifestyle, you know, we, we, we almost have one car per person in America. Uh, we have about one-tenth of that in China. Already all the cities are gridlocked. And uh, so you don't want every Chinese to have a car and a home like they're in America. We would need another planet just to park their cars. <laughs> so we, we want a different solution for mass transit, for better uh, energy consumption, for all of these. So part of infrastructure is necessary. You want, the, 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 you want good clean water and, and, and good clean living and cities that work and function, but you don't want 
the, the same development model in the West. Remember, it was 10% of humanity that got rich at the cost of 90%. The same 90% cannot have the same model. So we have to have a different, we have a huge land mass in Canada and the United States for very small population. You may think you have a big population, it's small. Right? So you, the rest of the world has huge population, very little land mass. So you have to have technologies that allows them to have a very decent, very wonderful lifestyle, but not necessarily an American lifestyle, because it, it just mathematically is impossible. So Shane already took us to the uh, recommendations and advice for our young folks and students, but I'd like for Noor and, and uh, Shamina to give us just one quick thing that, that you think our youth ought to keep in mind. Um, so I think that you, as the next generation, we don't know what the world's going to be like in 20 years at all. And I think the most important thing is to learn how to learn. So as you learn everything you're supposed to learn right now, um, the most important thing is figuring out the skill set that you need to continue learning throughout your life and to always kind of get better at getting better um, and, and have an open mind. I believe in presence. So if you look on your chairs, <laughs> every one of you should have received a black band, yeah? And by the way, everybody in here should have received it in your bag. So open the top zipper. Um, we had these made for you. And if you look at it, they have, they have words on them. But we chose words like love, fearless, connect, remember. So our hope is that, and, and by the way, when you see this, know that we sourced them. We bought them from the Africa Women's Business Collective. And they were made especially for this for this group. So the idea here is as much as, national, as much as we hear about governments and fighting and revolution and things like that, remember what Shane said. We are a global community of people. And so it's just as easy for us to source from Africa, get something from Mississippi. The world is really small, if you really think about it. And I cannot wait to see what you do with, as my niece Natalie says, the mess that we've left you all. So good luck. <laughs> thank you. And with that, thank you, Shane and Noor thank and Shabina. Um, and, and before we get up, I'd just like to say we have a very special treat for you. We have two Henry Crown Fellows who are going to join us on the stage. Suzanne Malvo is going to interview Bill Browder about fearless leadership. So please stick around. <laughs> 